Good morning, I'm Darrell West, Senior Fellow on Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on ways to reform the federal procurement and acquisitions process. So the federal government spends around $665 billion each year on federal contractors. Uh, that is about 10% of the federal budget. A lot of that, of course, uh, goes in the defense area and involves very large uh, companies, but we also see considerable money going to small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Yet many firms complain about paperwork and other barriers in the application process. There have been many efforts over the years to streamline the applications process and make it easier for small businesses and disadvantaged uh, firms to compete. So this week, uh, we have put out a new paper at Brookings on ways to reform the process, and we make a number of suggestions. One is to broaden the geographic distribution of federal contracts. Right now, about 12 states uh, get two thirds of the dollars. And so there's uh, relatively less money uh, going to the US heartland. Uh, so we argue there's a need for greater equity on a geographic uh, basis. Uh, we also talk about the importance of ensuring fairness, equity, and transparency in the process, providing better access for small businesses and economically disadvantaged firms, improving the training of government procurement officers who are actually supervising uh, this process, uh, increasing accountability by empowering end users in the selection process, using technology and machine learning to learn from data, uh, limiting the time period for legal challenges, and learning from the reforms that have taken place in other countries. For those who want additional details, uh, this paper is online at brookings.edu, and you're welcome to uh, take a look at that. To help us understand these issues, we're delighted to have three distinguished experts with us. Elaine Kmark is a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings. Uh, she's also an alum of the Clinton administration, where, along with Al Gore, she helped uh, reinvent government. B.B. Hidalgo is the Associate Administrator in the Office of Government Contracting and Business Development at the Small Business Administration. Matthew Blum is the Associate Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy in the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President. And if you have questions for our panelists, you can email them to us at events at brookings.edu, that's events at brookings.edu, or tweet at brookings.gov using the hashtag Brookings Procurement. So I wanna start with a history lesson from Elaine. So you worked on procurement issues 25 years ago in the Clinton administration. What problems did you see then and how did you seek to address them? Well, thank you, Daryl, and thanks for inviting me. This is a little bit like muscle memory for me because it's been a while since I delved in, into these issues. And actually, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Matt and Bibi about what's up and what they're facing today in set, almost 30 years later. Um, among the big issues we tackled way back in the first term of the Clinton administration was federal procurement. And we had two, we, we, we had two problems to tackle. One was just the amount of red tape that had developed around the procurement system and that was driving federal workers crazy. And the second were problems, and I suspect these are still around, problems buying information technology, although they were slightly different then than now. To give you an example of the first, of the problems that the government workers were facing, let me read you a, um, a regulation that people had to follow in order to buy ash trays. And I quote, ash receivers, tobacco, desk type, okay? The GSA outlined nine full pages of specs and drawings and the precise dimensions, color, polish, and markings required for glass ashtrays that would pass U.S. government standards. Um, as if the requirements that they, in, including requirements that they, in, that they include a minimum of four cigarette rests parallel to the outside top edge of the receiver, the specs included that the ashtrays should be sturdy. In order to see if they were sturdy enough, 
the specs required that they be tested. Okay, so to this regulation, AA-A710E, led to Al Gore's appearance on the David Letterman show for, for the young people, that was a nighttime show, um, where he donned goggles and broke an ashtray according to federal specs. And here were the specs, and I quote, the specimen should break into a small number of irregular pieces, not greater in number than 35, and it must not dice any piece one quarter inch or more on any three of its adjacent edges, excluding, excluding the thickness dimension, shall be included in the number counted. Well, as you can imagine, we had a lot of fun with military specs. Um, and, and with general procurement specs. And while the ashtray story was perhaps one of the silliest, there were many other examples. Steam traps that cost thousands of dollars in wasted energy while procurement officers waited to buy enough in bulk. And they so they would save like $10 on a steam trap, but they would cost $2,500 in energy wasted. Um, the Defense Department had a, its own specs for chocolate cake mix and therefore its own chocolate cake mix. None of us could ever figure out why soldiers needed mill, mill specs for their cake mix. And all of these were indicative of one big problem with government procurement, an overly centralized system that frustrated employees and that ended up costing the government more than it should. The second problem, and one which I expect um, you all are still dealing with, but I'll, I'll be curious to see what you say. A second problem with government procurement were the laws and regulations that failed to keep up with rapidly changing technology. When the Clinton administration came into office, com com commercial, pr commercial computing technology was just taking off. And federal workers wanted to know why they couldn't buy off the shelf. But the law at the time was made for an era when there were two sources of computer um, technology and hardware, EDS and IBM. That was it. And therefore, the law was created around the competition between these two giants and individual people didn't go into Staples and pick up pick up a laptop, okay? That was just not what was going on then. So we grappled with both of those issues. I still remember going to see Congressman Jack Brooks, who is passed uh, away now, as, as you would imagine. And back then he was pretty old. And Al Gore did his best, put on his best Southern accent to try to convince Jack Brooks that the world that he had created the law for in terms of computer technology was really not the world anymore, that the federal workforce really could have a, a whole variety of technology available to, available to them through the commercial marketplace. So that was, that was a big breakthrough, making that breakthrough for computer technology. We made a similar breakthrough when the Federal Aviation Administration had a, a pretty serious meltdown. Uh, I, I had a little deja vu in the last year over FAA. But back then, the meltdown was that they were using very, very old technology in many of their towers. And in fact, the, it was taking them 18 months to buy new technology from, from the time they put the money down to the time they, they got it. That was obviously unacceptable. It was causing all sorts of trouble. So we grappled with these issues. Um, we gave greater leeway to federal employees to buy simple things like office supplies from the commercial marketplace. And we simplified procedures for purchases under $100,000. And most importantly, perhaps for today's issues, we passed a new procurement law, which would allow in agencies to buy information technology more quickly. In other words, it made no sense back then to have these long, long, long lags for buying information technology, because in that time, the technology was changing. And that, of course, is the same today. 
Uh, the Federal Acquisition Reform Act of 1995 allowed for streamlined procedures for small dollar purchases. The Federal Acquisition Reform Act of 1996 created the Office of Chief Information Officer in cabinet departments and made it easier to buy commercial information technology. But before I hand it over to people who know more about this these days than I do, um, I, I want to just say in general, the kind of reviews that we did need to be constant. Red tape, complexity, um, technological at obsolescence, all of these things that tie up the procurement system is a little bit like the kudzu vine, as we know. It grows quickly and it overwhelms. And that's why you have to constantly be on the lookout for things that are happening in federal procurement, in, in fact, federal civil service, and a lot of other agencies that are really inimical to progress and to doing the right thing and saving the taxpayer dollars. So with that, I'm going to, I'm sure we'll come back to the problems today, but with that, I want to turn this over to people who know more about this uh, these days and um, can talk about the problems and barriers these days. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elaine. That's an amazing story about nine pages of specs for an ashtray. Glad you were able to take care of <laughs> that one. And also uh, passed some very important uh, legislation. And that legislation actually still is uh, very important for contemporary efforts. So Matthew, I know that you have been involved with procurement uh, issues for uh, many years. What do you think are the biggest barriers now? Well, uh, it was great to hear uh, Elaine's um, uh, uh, stories there. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving in the Clinton administration and working on the National P Performance Review. Uh, and I do think that the acquisition community has made important progress in shaping a system uh, that is more responsive to the needs of our citizens on both of the fronts that Elaine mentioned. Uh, before I, I mention uh, a few of the remaining challenges, I did want to just mention maybe three areas in particular where I think it's helpful to uh, us to see the progress that we have made uh, in this journey for a, um, a world-class acquisition system. One is I think that we've honed tools for conducting effective competition through streamlined acquisition procedures, multiple award contracts, interagency contracting, um, all of which are allowing us to do a better job at keeping up with the rapid pace of technological advancement uh, and avoid, avoiding those horrors that Elaine mentioned. Uh, it also uh, drew to mind Senator Cohen's famous computer chaos report that discussed how technology was outdated by the time the agency got it on contract and delivered it to the customer. Um, I think probably the most transformative and consequential initiative in acquisition over the last decade has been category management, where we organize our buying activities for common goods and services around market segment. This has given our community a real jumpstart on supply chain management by changing the mindset of our workforce from a bunch of independent buyers to an organized community that can deliver impactful demand results. And this helps both our local buying organizations that aren't left to do market research on their own and frees up time for them to focus on more complex and unique buys. And it also actually helps our, our, our businesses too, small and large, by creating greater certainty and consistency in market demand that is so critical to any business, uh, their ability to manage and thrive. Um, and it also helps taxpayers by reducing costs and improving performance. Second, we've also made great strides in creating an innovation-friendly acquisition environment. Um, after the healthcare.gov crisis, many luminaries were wondering if our system was too rigid to keep pace with 21st century problems. Um, and with the help of acquisition innovation advocates at every cabinet department and agency and a growing number of acquisition innovation labs, we have amassed uh, dozens of techniques to help deliver value at the speed of need. We have a knowledge management portal, we call it the periodic table of acquisition innovation that includes uh, well over 100 artifacts from agencies demonstrating successful results with accelerated delivery, enhanced performance, improved customer satisfaction, and lower cost. Um, so I think there's a lot we can take pride in, but there is much work yet to be done to make our system even more effective. And I would offer five challenges, Daryl. First, we need to double down on our ability to collaborate and act as an organized entity. 
Um, despite the progress that we've made on category management, we continue to lack a repeatable process for bringing our requirements communities together with the acquisition community to create these organized demand signals. And this capability is essential to rebuilding the economic health of our domestic supply chains uh, and the competitiveness of U.S. industries. Second, and equally important, we must make sure we're instilling equity into all of our stewardship activities, including category management, so we can capitalize on the entrepreneurial spirit in this country, which has brought applications for new small businesses to an all-time high. Um, we are working closely with BB and friends at SBA uh, and throughout the government to do just that with a series of actions to maximize the participation of SCBs, I'm sorry, small disadvantaged businesses and other underserved businesses in the federal marketplace, both in terms of the amount of spend and the breadth and depth of their participation. Uh, third, we have to accelerate our efforts to create an innovation-friendly acquisition environment. Um, our work to date has been helpful in sparking the creativity of the pioneers and fast followers in our workforce, but we need, and we need to keep that fire alive, but also do more to build an innovation mindset into the DNA of the broader workforce, such as by uh, teaching innovative thinking to new colleagues at the same time as they learn our regulations. Fourth, we have to pay close attention to the workforce, the lifeblood of our system, I think many of you have probably heard the statistic that only 7% of our workforce is under the age of 30, and this statistic should serve as a reminder of the importance in ensuring that our next generation workplace is effectively attracting the workforce of the future. And lastly, but not least, we need to strengthen acquisition data management. Um, the federal government generates billions of data points on millions of contracts awarded annually, yet most of this data remains out of the reach of our workforce. Um, an engaged workforce is a happy workforce, and there's no better way to, to ensure a seat at the table than to make sure that our workforce has access to the information they need when they need it. Okay, uh, thank you, Matthew. That was a, a great lesson in terms of how the federal government is starting to improve the uh, situation and the challenges that you, I think, uh, still remain. So, uh, Bibi, I want to bring you into the conversation, and I know you focus on small and medium-sized businesses. What do you see as the biggest barriers to those kinds of firms? Um, well, Daryl, you know, first, thank you uh, for uh, pulling this together and for your great work on this topic. And I think this is a really valuable conversation uh, as we try to figure out what are the ways that we can achieve efficiency, but also ensure that underserved businesses have, a, have an opportunity to compete. And uh, I, it brings me great joy to be here with Elaine K. Mark, who uh, was my professor in grad school on uh, uh, American uh, government and innovation. And so it's a proud moment to be able to share some of um, the work that we've done and that I learned through her work uh, in the Clinton-Gore administration. And of course, Matthew and I have had the opportunity to collaborate now on and off for over 10 years when I worked in the White House uh, under President Obama. We had a major initiative called Crush the Goals, where we met for the first time in history, the, uh, or, or actually I should say first time in close to a decade, the overall 23% small business contracting goal. And ever since then, I've been uh, so um, engaged and, and invested in this work, realizing just the enormous impact that it has on us as a nation and that how we represent ourselves around the globe. Um, it's truly remarkable out of our uh, uh, overall contracting budget, $154 billion goes to uh, contracting for small businesses, $154 billion uh, right now annually. And I wonder what other country in the world can say that? And to me, this is part of our of our secret sauce in a way as a nation. When I reflect on my time at the Treasury Department, you know, at that time we were very focused on making sure that we could preserve the the thirty year fixed rate mortgage. This was after the financial crisis. Also, part of our secret sauce as a nation. And as I really delve deeper and deeper into this issue over the last decade, I realize this isn't something that we learn in school necessarily or in our in our studies and professional studies, but this is part of it. This is one of the major ingredients going as far back as, as uh, then Senator Truman, who said we, we run the risk 
of clustering all our opportunity along the coast and along uh, with major corporations unless we do something about it. And that was in 1943 when uh, he got the Armed Services Procurement Act passed with a focus on small business contracting. And it's increased and evolved incredibly since then. But one of the things that President Biden realized, and, and this became very apparent to us when I, I led the, the contracting review uh, uh, during the transition team for on, on small business contracting, is that we have, we have to figure out ways to um, ensure that we continue to create efficiencies and, as Matthew says, be stewards of, of taxpayer dollars, but also always ensuring that we're creating opportunity. But that is a critical tension uh, that we need to balance to make sure that we're always creating uh, avenues um, for firms to compete and for firms to innovate and, and ultimately get their foot in the door. And so on day one of the administration, he signed an executive order on racial equity in underserved communities, and he cites procurement there. And it is just so extraordinary to be able to start the administration with that right out of the gate. And as Matthew can tell you, from, from the very beginning, we have been collaborating very closely with uh, OMB, with all the White House councils, with the major contracting agencies to figure out, all right, how do we put the policies in place that will ensure that we start to achieve uh, further equity in procurement? And then following that, in June of 21, the president uh, went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, this was uh, the 100th commemoration of the, um, the, the massacre on Black Wall Street. And that's where he committed the administration to a 15% small and disadvantaged business goal. Um, and that we would achieve that by uh, 2025. And again, a really, really remarkable moment for us as a nation, because now we are all working in tandem to figure out every day how we get closer and closer to that 15%. And it takes real incredible coordination and collaboration to put all the policies in place to do that. One of the things we did in December of 21 is roll out a package of equity and procurement reforms. And, um, I like to refer to it as ADAPT, um, as an as a acronym, um, because it was focused on, um, on creating more access, um, uh, uh, leveling the playing field, creating more transparency, delivering on accountability. Some things that we did during the Obama administration and that we are now um, taking to another level. So I'll give you an example. During the Obama administration, we realized that we needed to flip the script somewhat and, and have more accountability within the acquisition uh, workforce and among program buyers to go out of their way to meet more small firms, to meet more socioeconomic firms. And so we put the goals, the overall 23% goal, and in some cases, some of the agencies also the four socioeconomic goals, into the performance evaluations of senior executive staff. This was for buyers as well as uh, acquisition staff. And that's one of the things we heard from a lot of the small business heads at the agencies is if you start with acquisition, you're too late. You have to start with the agencies, the buyers that have the purse strings and make sure that they're developing the relationships with the small businesses and the and the minority owned businesses and women owned and tribal. And so performance evaluations was key for to help us get to that 23% goal. So we've since done that now under uh, President Biden, we uh, reintroduced that, but it's across now all 24 agencies and it's all five goals. So it's the overall 23%, and these are all congressionally mandated goals, but now these are the ones that are in the performance evaluations. The small disadvantaged business goal, the women owned business, hub zone, and service disabled veteran. So that was one of the key components. In terms of transparency, um, this is one of the things I'm most excited about is for the first time in United States history, we released the data uh, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. 
Um, and so we can see as um, based on what we call like the presumed disadvantage categories, just how much uh, the, this contracting opportunity is going to black owned businesses, Latino owned businesses, Asian American and tribal and South Asian. And so we have that broken down um, on the SBA website for fiscal year 21. And this is part of our great challenge um, because again, we have such an enormous amount of opportunity going to small businesses around the United States to minority owned businesses. But still, as far as black owned uh, uh, business contracting, we're only at 1.6%. 1.6% of all federal contracting dollars going to black owned businesses. Now that 1.6% is $9 billion, 9 billion that go, that is awarded to black owned firms across the United States annually. And so I often say, imagine, just imagine for a moment if we were able to double that because the talent is there, the businesses are there. Um, it's just a matter of making those connections and ensuring that our acquisition workforce and our buyers are able to, to connect with the firms that have this incredible skill set that they can offer the federal government. But if you if we were able to get to 3.2%, that's another $9 billion in, in the in among uh black owned firms in the United States. So that's nine billion dollars in additional opportunity and jobs and lifting communities. And the same thing with the Latino community. We're only at 1.78% of uh, Hispanic owned business contracting. And again, that's over $10 billion. So that's part of what we're really focused on right now is how we create those uh, that access to opportunity um, to not just uh, small disadvantaged businesses, but also underserved firms among small disadvantaged businesses. And one of the things that we did together with Matthew and the team at OMB is um, ensure that all the socioeconomic firms, women, hub zone, veteran, minority owned, were, uh, are, were part of the category management tiering system. So as of December of 21, all socioeconomic, that's about 30,000 firms, were automatically considered tier two in category management, which is the, which is the um, system that Matthew talked about that creates efficiencies, but at the same time, he wanted to make sure created significant opportunities for the firms that have the ability to, to partner with the federal government. So I will, I will uh, finish my remarks by saying, I remember so clearly the ashtray example when I was in graduate school. And and uh, uh, she got my attention then, and she has it now for sure. And it's so enjoyable to be able to put some of these ideas into practice to figure out how we continue to streamline, but also continue to create as much access as possible because that's what makes us so um, extraordinary as a nation. Thank you, uh, Beauty, for that overview and also for setting very ambitious uh, goals for what you'd like to accomplish in the next uh, few years. So, Elaine, I want to come back to you. What reforms would you like to see? How do you think we can improve the contemporary process? Uh, uh, Elaine, you are muted. If you could unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Well, one way, and I was thinking about this as BB. Uh, who makes me very proud to, as a student, um, as she was citing these statistics. What I think the story may be better than she is saying, and, and for the following reason, such an outsized portion of our procurement dollars go to defense, and they go to the acquisition of these gargantuan projects. Take the uh, B-21 Raider, okay, this is the new stealth bomber, very cool plane. It's clocking in at $700 million per plane. It'll be $2 billion by the end of the decade. And, you know, Northrop Grumman is making that. I mean, there's no, there's no small business that's going to make the B-21 Raider. And so I wonder if, in fact, the story is a little bit even better, because some of these weapon systems, you, you, they're not going to be made by small businesses, 
ipso facto, they're going to be built by huge publicly traded companies that are in the defense space. They're Boeing, they're Lockheed, they're Northrop, Northrop Grumman. And um, I would ask both BB and Matthew if there's been any progress on the question of subcontractors. Because remember, these enormous um, military contractors, they have tons of subs, right? They have hundreds of subs spread out across the United States, et cetera. And it seems to me that you could do two things here. First of all, separate out these big projects. And I think your numbers look even better. Um, and then secondly, have a look at the subcontractors. And are those subcontracts of these enormous you know, um, military contracts, are they going to minorities and women-owned business and disadvantaged businesses? If, um, if, uh, uh, thank you, oh, thank you, Elaine. Uh, maybe uh, Matthew, we'll start with uh, you on that. And I don't know if you want to respond to Elaine's specific uh, question on subcontractors uh, and how you can uh, break out the data. But I also want you to talk about kind of the efforts that the Biden administration has uh, made in creating uh, new goals for itself. If you could describe those efforts and uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Sure. Uh, to, to specifically to um... Aline's comment, I think you're spot on. Um, and um, and one of our one of the initiatives that um, uh, BB and I will be working even more closely and 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 specifically on is on subcontracting. I think the timing is actually great because everything that we're doing is focused around supply chains. And we are for many reasons, economic reasons, security reasons. Uh, domestic sourcing reasons, we want to bring those supply chains closer to our workforce. And, and, and we have always recognized, um, frankly, that, you know, subcontracting is the gateway into the marketplace. Today's subcontractors are tomorrow's prime contractors. So we really do need to do more in, um, and, and build on efforts that we've taken to date to make sure that we're doing a good job um, in negotiating with our prime contractors for effective subcontracting plans. We want them, and we know that they are looking to build diversity into their supply chains. And when they do that, that helps the federal marketplace. So I, I think it is, is absolutely a spot on a correct point that we, we need to be paying more attention to uh, subcontracting and making sure that you know, those relationships, although we don't have privity of contract, that they should feel part of the marketplace and our initiatives should, should reach and impact them. Lifting up for a minute um, to our priorities more generally, um, they are laid out in the president's management agenda through a three-pronged strategy. Uh, the first uh, is focused on creating a diverse and resilient federal marketplace. Um, and this prong includes increasing the number of new entrants and improving our ability to retain entrants and reverse the decline in the supply chains where we need more capacity and capability. Um, this prong also includes increasing adoption and adaption of innovative buying practices on our knowledge management portal. Um, innovation really goes hand in hand with advancing equity and bringing small businesses uh, into our marketplace, as Congress did, acknowledged in the uh, Price Act. Um, many innovative buying strategies are designed to reduce bid and proposal costs, such as using technical demonstrations or code challenges for IT or virtual or oral presentations. Um, and these strategies can build resilience and address the small business complaint, Daryl, that you noted in your article about government paperwork and cost, because they save the expense of having to hire a professional proposal writer, um, but they still enable agencies to evaluate risk and probably in a better uh, fashion to determine if a particular vendor is a good fit with the agency team. Um, and this prong also includes a direction to strengthen domestic supply chains through increased program project and buying office participation and pilot plans to organize federal demand. As I mentioned earlier, we need to do more to bring those program people into uh, the conversations early and get the acquisition folks aligned so that we can send those organized demand signals. We can build the relationships that BB is talking about and not first thinking about that when we're ready to or we have uh, something that is ready to go on to a contract. Um, so that's the first prong, um, diversity and resilience in the marketplace. The second prong involves strengthening the ma management of acquisition data. And as I mentioned earlier, our workforce requires and needs on-demand access 
access to reliable information across the federal enterprise to make informed uh, planning decisions um, at the point of need. Um, and a good example of this is what we just did in the equity space this winter. So in February, we issued guidance directing agencies to begin benchmarking and tracking their efforts to bring in new entrants. Um, but we didn't stop there. We simultaneously rolled out a supplier-based dashboard that for the first time identifies for each agency the, the mix of new, recent, and established entities doing businesses across the government and in their agency. What is, this, what is the impact of doing this? Well, it, uh, it, it allows a head of a contracting activity to see how her agency compares to other agencies with similar missions and confer with those that may be having greater success in building diversity within their market. Um, it allows a category manager to evaluate the breadth and depth of participation in a market segment uh, and have a strategic conversation with companies who are industry leaders to see how their supplier basis compares. And I should, I should note that this, this dashboard, um, in addition to, sh to uh, uh, in, uh, providing information on new and recent entrants, also indicates their socioeconomic status, so, which is critically important as we, as we rebuild our supplier base. Um, and we also launched a second tool, a procurement equity tool to help contracting personnel with their market research to identify information on socioeconomic uh, Matthew, I'm not hearing you uh, anymore. I don't know if somehow you got muted or what. Okay, while Matthew is figuring out his uh, connection issue, uh, maybe Bibi, we can come to you. And I don't know if you wanted to address the subcontracting issue or kind of more generally what SBA is doing to try and improve the uh, process from its uh, standpoint. Yeah, definitely, because um, this is actually a really big challenge for us. Um, again, when we came in at the start of the administration and we poured over the data, we realized that we've lost 40% of our small business um, uh, contracting industrial base over the last decade. Many firms now that are actually um, have to be subcontractors and could no longer be prime contractors. And that's, that is something that we need to be very careful again as a, as a country, um, because even though we're finding efficiencies at the same time, there are costs to communities sometimes. And that's what we need to keep front and center. So as far as, um, you know, the president's focus in signing the executive order was on equity in procurement. And um, a lot of firms, as I've traveled all throughout the United States, um, are, you know, concerned that they now have to um, default to subcontracting. And then they are not direct contractors to the United States government. So subcontracting, um, as Matthew said, is certainly a gateway and it is critical for our, our firms. But uh, this is part of what I love about this job is that we have very clear prime contracting goals set by Congress. And I don't know if any other country in the world is that focused on prime contracting. But that's what really, really empowers our small business industrial base. When they can say that NASA is their direct client, when they can say defense is their direct client, when then and they have that opportunity to really build out their employee base and opportunities um, uh, you know, uh, uh, across their portfolio. And as far as um, what we do, fortunately, is uh, refer to small business eligible dollars. So um, thankfully, when we, when we do set our goals and look at the dollar uh, volume, it's based on what is eligible for a small business to compete. So they can't build necessarily, you know, the, the engine for a major, you know, B1 uh, bomber, or, but they can, as the president has said, they can build that small firm, for example, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, that builds the handrails for the for the Navy deck. You know, to you and me, that may not mean anything, but to them, it means the world. To their employees, it means the world. 
And that's where we provide that gateway to larger opportunities. So I'll give you an example. In my office, we negotiate with the agencies, particularly I have a whole team of what we call procurement center representatives. Sometimes I refer to them as the watchtowers. Again, remarkable that we have this in place. All my, my team of PCRs review all these acquisitions, particularly if they're contracts that are being bundled and are becoming inaccessible to small firms. So we noticed one for $7 billion that there was no small business designation. And the thinking might be, well, you know, this is for, uh, for warfighters and small businesses can't do the work. Well, when they sat down and negotiated with my team of lawyers and procurement center representatives, they were able to carve out two billion of that seven billion for small businesses. That's over a decade. And also for the first time for a bundled contract, we were able to carve out a small disadvantaged business goal within that. So I, I would caution that whenever we see any of these major contract opportunities, in, in reality, there is a lot of opportunity for, for small firms. They're all the different component parts. And in the case of that bundled acquisition, the large corporation you know, was able to convince the acquisition team that they would, they would do a great job in subcontracting. And that's what often happens is the large will say, we'll take care of it and we'll be, we'll manage the subs. But what we hear from the firms is that has a huge impact on our ability to compete and our ability to um, partner directly with the firms and our ability to, to really grow our business model. And they're, they're asked to us is to always keep our eyes on that prime contracting opportunity not losing sight of the subcontracting. And we actually put together a really robust plan for that, for Build Back Better, as we like to say, rest in peace, Build Back Better, but we did. And to really, you know, have more accountability around subcontracting um, and to also make sure that it was in fact really a gateway to become to go from being a sub to a prime. Um, so we're working now with the limited, since we don't have those resources, we're, look, we're looking now to see where else we can uh, uh, make regulatory or policy changes to improve that. But that said, the eyes, the, the prize here is prime. And that uh, that's, again, what's part of our major ingredient and in success as a nation is that small firms can partner directly with the United States government and really grow and have enormous potential from there. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to move to uh, questions from the audience, but I have one question for uh, Matthew and Abibi. And Matthew, I'll start with uh, you, uh, which is how to broaden the geographic distribution of federal contracts. So in my report, when I looked at the state uh, breakdown, basically much of the federal money uh, is going to about 12 uh, states. Are there ways to incorporate geographic distribution as a factor just so we can improve the equity from a geographic standpoint? So, uh, and I apologize when I got disconnected. I don't know if you uh, heard, if I heard me mention, but um, one of the tools that we've launched on equity and is a new procurement and equity tool that actually will help with that specific issue. Um, it's designed to help our contracting personnel with market research efforts to identify information on our socioeconomic and other small business contractors who sell in sectors or geographic areas where an agency seeks increased representation in its contracting base uh, and entities that have never received a, a federal contract award. Uh, under this tool, a contracting officer, either in headquarters or in the hinterlands, can see the geographic layout of all the vendors registered to work with the federal government. Um, and they can both see um, where their place of, of business is, and they can also see where the government has awarded contracts and where their agency has awarded contracts. Now, um, in most cases, this isn't going to mean that the business is going to automatically receive awards since we don't, agencies have limited authority to do direct awards, although they could do that through SBA's 8A program if they find a qualified entity in a geographic area of interest. Um, uh, but uh, it gives the agency the important ability to reach out to entities in these underserved populations that aren't getting a lot of work 
um, and might be interested in participating in an agency competition. So they can speak to them about the mission and the capabilities. Um, they can talk to each other. Um, and I think by increasing interest in participating um, in competitions is, is the first step to, to getting more awards in many of these states that, that you mentioned aren't currently uh, getting active uh, dollars uh, in, in federal procurement. Okay, thank you. Uh, BB, anything you'd like to add on the geography front from an SBA standpoint? Yeah, I think it's a really excellent point. Um, we've been looking at the map and um, I, I heard the data point you you gave. The, one of the ones that we often say is um, over 50% of opportunities con concentrated in 35 congressional districts around the country. And so Heartland, for example, is an area where we can really work to make more inroads. And um, fortunately that's where the president went to make uh, his announcement um, when he was in uh, Oklahoma. Um, I had the opportunity to, to visit an extraordinary uh, tribal entity in Nebraska. Um, and they're just doing some ex you know phenomenal work. Um, they were hired by the State Department to uh, help uh, to work with the Iraqi government to draft their constitution. Um, they were also hired by state to uh, create uh, uh, basketball programs and infrastructure with um, within Iraq. So it's just remarkable what some of the, the small firms are doing and the socioeconomic firms are doing. But also they have a model where they, they reinvest in the local uh, tribal community, the Ho-Chunk tribe. And, um, you know, creating senior housing and uh, um, uh, scholarship programs and early learning initiatives and um, and really doing extraordinary work through the 8A Soul Source program to lift uh, the community out of poverty. And so it's examples like that where I think we can continue to engage uh, firms in areas that um, historically are not represented in federal contracting and find ways to continue to empower them. All tribal land, for example, is considered hub zone. So if at least 30% of the their workforce is also living in a hub zone, then they can also get a hub zone designation. So we're looking at all the ways to try to continue to create access in, in areas um, that are not as represented. And, and our, through our efforts to also track new entrants, that's also really critical. And that's something, again, as Matthew mentioned, we released that in our uh, procurement reforms um, to ensure that it's that we're bringing back the industrial base, the small business base, and we're bringing in new entrants into the federal marketplace. And it's exciting because we have a lot of agencies coming to us asking for um, for firms that are new to the marketplace and are trying are developing strategies to bring them into the fold. So I think we're going to see a lot of growth in other parts of the country as a result. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. So we're starting to get some great questions from our audience. Uh, Zoe Ryder of the Project on Government Oversight wants to know whether uh, any of you can imagine an e-procurement type of platform for the United States? And Zoe points out that other countries already are doing this. Is this something uh, the U.S. can watch? So I, I would I would note, and I think you actually referenced it in your in your article, Daryl. I mean, we're doing doing a lot with with e-procurement, but one that. Um, you know, maybe a way to bring in some small businesses that aren't currently in the marketplace is GSA's uh, platform that was designed under um, uh, uh, laws that, that Congress passed and is designed to meet businesses where they are. So there are several um, of the largest commercial platforms, you know them, um, that have tens of thousands of small businesses on them. And uh, right now we have for very small dollars words that you can make using the purchase card goes back to the National Performance Review um, that, are, that are easy to make um, businesses, I should say buyers, um, federal buyers can engage with these small businesses that are already doing business on these platforms. So even uh, 
before they uh, have to invest, uh, the businesses have to invest a lot of dollars and all of understanding all of the government unique requirements, they have an opportunity to get their, their toe uh, wet and experience what it's like to do business with the federal, federal marketplace and, and individual agencies and, and their missions. Um, and once they do this, um, um, we are encouraging our, our guidance that we just issued. We're encouraging agencies to have uh, these businesses, if they want to do larger dollar spend, to get registered to do business with the government. Um, we have lots and lots of tools for very small dollar acquisitions um, using simplified procedures that allow them to, to build their resilience. Um, and to to um, um, kind of increase their um, their their presence in the federal marketplace. So I think that um, taking greater advantage of these of these portals can be a great way to meet businesses where they are. So that at least initially, how they do business with us is very similar to how they're doing business with with the private sector. And it goes back to Elaine's point from from early on. You know, for a lot of our cost type purchases, we want to be able to take advantage of those economies and buy things off the shelf just like commercial buyers do and not make you know companies develop separate business lines or invest heavily in understanding government unique requirements that really aren't as important you know in that market space great uh, thank you so uh, kate Stoll has a question about purchasing ai systems so she's with the american association for the advancement of science and she wants to know what procurement regulations need to be updated to purchase ai Anybody wants Elaine. to jump in, Elaine? Yeah, you know, I saw this in the questions earlier and I don't have an answer to it because I don't know enough about it anymore, but it does strike me that, you know, back in the nineties, we were really on the cusp of an explosion of the information technology market, okay? People were buying laptops, um, phones, et cetera. Things that we take for granted nowadays that, that a lot of, tons of Americans have, um, was that marketplace was just coming to be. And of course, the procurement rules and regs were way behind the eight ball. Um, when I saw this question, I thought, wow, this may be just like it was then, only now for AI. And what it brings to home to me is, and I think this was an issue that you touched on in your paper, Daryl, is training the procurement workforce. Um, we just, we're going to really need a very, very much more sophisticated workforce to evaluate AI procurement, um, to judge when it is useful to a, to an agency to, to enter into these contracts. It just seems to me we've got a whole new world opening up in front of us. And um, I'm anxious to hear what the smart people working in the government today um, have to have to say about it. So, Matthew so or that, BB, that, that would be right. one of you. So, <laughs> so, uh, to, to your last point, start there with uh, workforce development. Uh, I think you're 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 exactly right, Elaine. And um, I I didn't mention earlier when when, when my phone disconnected um, that the third prong of the PMA involves developing an inspired and engaged acquisition workforce. Um, you know, so that we can attract the workforce of the future. And one important step is, that we took recently was to modernize our model for professional growth from one that's built on multiple certifications and classroom training early in a career to a foundational certification that allows a member of the workforce to build their technical skills and acquire competencies by obtaining credentials at the point of need. Um, we did this um, after healthcare.gov uh, we built that as a credential on digital IT um, and worked with the U.S. Digital Service uh, so that, um, and, it, and it's very much built on the principles of apprenticeship and learning at the hands of experts to acquire needed skills, in that instance, for buying cloud computing, software service, and the like. Um, I think we've trained more than 1,000 members of the workforce through what's called the Digital IT Acquisition Program, or DICAP. Uh, and many of them are not only digital experts, but they're leaders in the use of many of these innovative modern buying practices, agile acquisition and the like. Um, and I think similarly, as we think about AI, you know, I think everybody uh, listening knows that the great powers that AI has, and we need to, you know, have practices that uh, encourage um, and enable us to take advantage of 
those technologies, but we have to do it in a responsible manner and 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 make sure that we understand um, you know what are the consequences of AI. AI doesn't replace human intelligence, and so as we we move forward, we need to make sure that there are protocols that are again lowering barriers to entry, so that we can you know uh, leverage that power, but also do so in a responsible manner. And and we need to think about the skill sets that are needed. Um, for our workforce and being able not only to negotiate appropriate terms that make sure that whether we're buying AI for the purpose of doing smarter research and acquisition, or it's embedded in systems that we use to help with human capital or detecting fraud, um, that we understand how that AI is working, how those algorithms are working. And we, you're, Elaine is right, we're going to need a level of expertise um, to understand what questions we should be asking and what expectations we should be putting on contractors and then how we can provide effective oversight to make sure that those things are happening so that we're not um, exposing ourselves to unnecessary national security risks or human, human rights challenges. So there's a lot there and we have to think carefully through uh, the best way forward to get that effective balance of promoting innovation but also doing it in a responsible manner. I think we have time just for one more question. Earlier, we were discussing supply chain issues and how they are affecting procurement and acquisitions. And this deals with domestic sor uh, sourcing of uh, products in uh, the Buy America Act, uh, but also oh, geopolitics, the security issues uh, that are uh, popping up. How are these kind of supply chain issues affecting how you think about acquisitions and procurement? Bibi, I don't know if you have any particular comments on that. Um, I mean, I, we, we talk about it as kind of it's a perfect example of how we need to really empower and invest in, in the firms and in the United States and uh, rebuild manufacturing. And this is something that the uh, president um, has been highlighting in his recent travels, uh, like to Syracuse, New York um, and elsewhere. And so from a small business standpoint, we feel like that that's what can give us a, a cutting edge is to um, empower the firms um, that haven't had the opportunity to offshore and have their operations here and help them grow and scale so that we don't find ourselves in a similar situation again with such severe supply chain shortages. Um, I know through the um, uh, initiatives that uh, Matthew uh, has created, um, they have some, you know, additional thoughts on on really shoring up our supply chain. But without a doubt, we see this, and I know the president as well. Is this is an opportunity to empower our small business industrial base, um, provide them access to the capital that they need, and also to ensure that they're gaining access to the contract opportunities so they can build out um, these critical supply chains. So, I think your thoughts on supply chain issues. Yeah, so I, I would just say, uh, you know, next year, by the way, is the 50th anniversary of our office of federal return policy. It's a great inflection point, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about, um, as we look forward, um, increasing our attention and our capabilities around supply chains. And and we've, we've talked a little today about the erosion of some of those supply chains and how we need to rebuild them. Um, this is complex, and it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but what we do know is that it requires an approach that avoids boiling the ocean. We, we, we can't just say, you know, we have X thousand, tens of thousands of, of contractors and we need to just add 10%. We need to look at uh, identifying and evaluating priority supply chains where domestic capability and cap capacity is lacking or where diversity is at risk. And it needs to be a whole of government approach that has the active participation of our category managers, our small business specialists, the program owners that understand the demand side challenges, our industrial policy and manufacturing experts, including our friends in our new Made in America office, all of whom can bring insight into supply side uh, considerations. I think that's the way that we're going to you know, be able to rebuild 
capacity and ensure the strong breadth and depth of entity participation in a given market segment uh, because there are so many variables that, that affect the economic conditions relative to a supply chain. We need to do this by identifying priority supply chains and then doing a whole of government, bring the community together to help figuring out the best way to strengthen those supply chains. Great, uh, terrific. Well, I want to thank Elaine, uh, BB, and Matthew for sharing your insights. It's a great conversation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. And those of you who are interested in uh, other ways to reform the acquisitions process, you can check out my new paper on that topic at brookings.edu. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you.